10 verses 15 uh, through 10 or 5 through 10 and it comes from the message and if you're not familiar with the message it's a modern paraphrase of the Bible uh, and it, I think it gives us some uh, insight into it using modern language and I think this uh, is especially true with this passage. Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead, touch the untouchables, kick out demons. You have been treated generously, so live generously. Don't think you have to put on a fundraising campaign before you start. There's good words there. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment, and all you need to keep that going is three mails a day. Travel light. So I think those are good words for all of us. Okay, so I'm giving a basic overview of what experiences I had at annual conference. First off, I want to thank you, my church family, for sending me. I don't know if you knew that, but you did. This was my first trip, I'd never been, and it was a roller coaster. There was a lot of information in a very short span of time. The most interesting thing that I heard from almost all the people I talked to was how different this conference was from the past years. Bishop Grant Hagia did a good job of creating an atmosphere where all were welcome to discuss things without feeling any hostility, no matter how contentious the topic was. Most of the conference focused on topics that were to be discussed and voted on so that they could then be sent on to general conference. Since annual conference is so large in and of itself, we split into smaller groups and that facilitated being able to discuss in a, in a smaller group manner um, the various topics. Uh, there will be a special conference in 2019 that will deal with how the church moves forward regarding the LGB QTI plus community. Sorry if I left any of those uh, letters out. Um, so we didn't directly discuss this particular topic um, for a vote, but it was frequently referenced in examples of how people can discuss a topic they may not agree on, but they can still remain friends. If you want to know more about the, the nitty gritty details of the conference, how we voted, what we voted on, um, you can find it online at www calpacumc.org slash AC2017. And if you need that website, I can give it to you later. Um, each morning, there was a service in the university chapel. It had invigorating music and a message to help us get centered for the day. Uh, my favorite of these services uh, was on the last day when there were youth that were leading the service and, and speaking. There were three young men that have felt the calling and are on track to eventually go into the ministry, and they gave their life stories. Each was very, very passionate, but in different ways. And they gave me hope for the future of this church and just how passionate they were in moving forward. Music plays a huge part um, in my idea of worship. Every morning service had songs that we were invited to sing with and had a contemporary feel to it. Um, one morning, I uh, was led by a self-proclaimed punk rocker. We actually saw a picture of him earlier. Uh, he had quite the outfit going on. But he was a great performer, and he, had, he brought a good energy to that day. Uh, I heard a few grumblings about this, since we didn't sing too many traditional hymns. Uh, <laughs> Saturday night was the ordination ceremony, and the organ had been broken the whole week. Our own Sheree Jones was concerned that it wouldn't be fixed in time and that the ceremony would lose some of its grandeur. However, it was repaired just in time. And it created this great contrast between the contemporary music all week and then this 
pomp and circumstance of a truly wonderful pipe organ and a, I think, five-piece brass section with all of the people that were being ordained in all of their robes and fanfare. It was a, a wonderful contrast for that. Um, as Pastor Diane said, annual conference is lowering the amount of apportionment for next year's budget. Yay. Uh, the reasoning that the bishop gave for this was complaints by local churches saying that all their funds were going to apportionments. They weren't able to put any money back into their own community and able to make their church more inviting or more productive. Um, he had a wonderful diagram that I believe uh, Marion will actually go over that explained how the annual conference exists for the sake of the local church, not the other way around. Uh, local churches exist to make disciples, to transform the world. And it is very encouraging to see that the bishop is listening to the local church and working to adapt the church to these changing times. The bishop was very clear that laity needed to be involved in keeping the church alive and well. It doesn't just fall on the clergy. We need to look at what this community here needs in a church and where there are people in need of faith that haven't been reached out to yet. There's no, this is no longer the time when people are actively looking to join a church. It isn't the culture like it was in the 60s and 70s. There are so many other priorities, obligations, now that we need to help people realize that having a faith community is worthwhile in the long run and enriches lives in so many ways. One way that Pastor Diane and I discussed on the long drive home was the community at Paloma Park, right across the street. Most Sundays, including this one, I saw them over there, there's a huge group of people that play soccer all day there. I don't know if they go to another church, but they might be a good group to reach out to. They already are here, they're right across the street. Most of them don't speak English very well. And maybe we could bring them here for something else, like English classes or lessons. By having them come here for something else, they might find that the people here are quite nice and might find out about our faith journeys and decide, hey, Maybe we could come there. Maybe we could come there on a Thursday evening for something and find out that this is a worthwhile thing to invest in. There are other places in the community that you know of that I may not know of, and you could find a way to reach out to them. There's a lot more to the conference, but it is hard for me to put into words. I would really recommend going if you've never been. Uh, having a say in how the church moves forward is quite empowering makes you feel like you're more than just a member of a small church that has a little bit of impact worldwide. Please uh, ask me if you have any questions about the, on, about the conference. I'll do my best to answer them. Um, but right now, Marion is gonna give her point of view and go a little bit more into depth than some of the other things since she's been before. Well, good morning. <laughs> Sarah and I um, are grateful to share with you some of what our experiences were. First of all, I want to explain about this strip of fabric that you have. As you arrived this morning, <laughs> you found this strange thing in your bulletin. But our hope was that as much as possible, we could engage our congregation with some of the things that we experienced at annual conference. So this is something that we have the opportunity to use on the first day of conference. We were asked to take this fabric and write on it your prayers for healing, for hope, along with maybe intercessory prayer needs, and whatever you feel that is important to you to put on here. And as you leave the service today, we'd like to invite you to, with a little carefulness, you can insert it in the mesh of the wire on our cross that is waiting for you in the narthex. So that's what that's all about. <laughs> 
our team that went to conference, as you would know, would be Pastor Rayfield and Mark Rayfield, Ken, Sarah, and I. And we really, I think, did a good job of trying to experience as much of conference as we could. Sarah is a whiz. I'm sure she must have been on the track team somewhere along in her schooling. <laughs> the first thing I wanted to show, with, show you is this. Now, if you are a person that is really into the computer, all that is right there on your computer. But there are a lot of us that still prefer to have it in paper copy. So this is what you get when you're going to go to conference. And it contains reports. It, it contains all of the things that have gone on in our conference for a whole year from every single church in the conference. So we had a lot of homework before we went. And I think we tried to be diligent about it. And it also told us the things that we would be asked to be making decisions about and legislation and things such as that. So there is that part of it. Before you go, you do have some homework. This year's annual conference was made up with a logo of four symbols, which you can see on the overhead. I'd like to share with you the, think, the thinking behind that. We have the three, one, one large square, as you can see, became three rectangles. It is a transformation of number, color, and shape. And you will see that the large circle became many small circles. And the theme for the conference was, as you can see, from here to there. Well, what was that all about? As, as was suggested, the logo is a symbolic representation of who we are or what is our identity. Here, in our own church, as well as a conference, as well as challenging us in getting there, or as, as this logo tries to demonstrate the transformative process. This Thursday afternoon, there were 1,500 people who gathered together in the Memorial Chapel for our 60th year of meeting at the University of Redlands. Many volunteers had gathered on the campus three days before to arrange air conditioning, to arrange communication, to arrange all the things that were needed for conducting all of the affairs of the conference. All this was done by volunteers. We have a lot of people in our conference that have experience in the field of television, movies, all that sort of thing. So they have been a great, great privilege to have them help us. Bishop Grant Hagia, who has now been with us one year, offered the Episcopal Address. Before becoming bishop, he was a pastor here in our conference. And so he knew many people, and he had some leadership roles in the conference before he was selected to be a bishop. Sarah has already expressed her perceptions about the atmosphere of the conference being different from what other people remembered. And I'd like to talk about that just a little bit. Having been able to be privileged to attend conference a number of years, either as a representative of our congregation or of our district, and from some conference things, uh, I've been to quite a few conferences. We have had wonderful bishops, but there's something unique about Bishop Hygieia. About 10 years ago, 
I was um, serving on a group called the Conference Leadership Team, which is now called The Table. And we had the responsibility of planning conference, of planning the future for the work of the conference, and looking at all the details of what was happening in the world at that time. You know, think 10 years back. It's been a while. And it was all good. We made plans. But you know, the plans just kind of limped along. They didn't, they just didn't click with everybody. And so, as I'm reflecting on it, I think that Bishop Hygieia has some gifts that are very special. He is a good listener. He did have the benefit of knowing probably quite a few people in, in the conference that are pastors and leaders in the conference. But he also is interested in what we think. And he talks to people. He wandered in the cafeteria and sat down and talked with people, he and his wife. Um, he's talked to people everywhere in the conference. He's traveled. And he's done a lot of fact gathering, but also a lot of team building, I think, as he's gone on this journey. And the bottom line of this is the plans from here to there that were presented to us, I think have a really good chance of being understood and implemented. Because we have a bishop who has laid the foundation of trust, who has laid the foundation of encouragement, and he's just just made such a difference in the attitude and work of the conference, which has always worked well. I don't want to give you a, an incorrect uh, impression, but it was so much easier this time, and so much, it just flowed, and everybody was in, in um, understanding what this is all about. We're going to look at another uh, picture here. In his address, he shared that since he became a bishop, he has had a burning goal to re revitalize the churches, not just in our conference, but the churches. The statistics of our conference show a decline in the past 10 years. That was what we were working with 10 years before. So nothing's changed in that regard. He shared his belief that this occurs when we give up the opportunity to transform our leadership around the world in United Methodism. United Methodism has not been clear as to where we need to go and why we need to go there. Pastor Diane has kept us as a congregation very well informed about the current uh, tumultuous events and divide over the LGBT issue. On average, the denomination has had divisions every 50 years. I thought that was an interesting statistic. What has th caused division? It has been about doctrine, it's been about slavery, it's been about culture, so dividing is not really new to the United Methodist Church. It has become, he has become more convinced that the church must stay together and that there is a way to go forward together. And he was very effective in presenting that whole issue with um, his talk. He believes that love and reconciliation wins over fear and wins over hatred by showing love and respect for others that's what we must do we must center our attention on the mission god has given us as addressed in our scripture for today and now as we look at this 
diagram, if you can read it. <laughs> At the center is God in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. This is our core, and everything emanates from the center. Communion with God, spiritual spirituality must be our center. Transformation is a central theme in terms of language. All of the outside spokes you see there in the symbol are transformative. There are four circles. One is about transforming leaders. One is about transforming lives. One is about transforming the world. And one is about transforming a vital congregation. Revitalization means we live to the potential of our churches. Like deferred maintenance, we are paying the price of not revitalizing our churches for such a long time. Resources, we must put out put all of our resources, financial, human, time, and energy toward healthy and vital congregations. These main priorities are centered around some ethos. The annual conference will resource our local churches, laity, and clergy. Local churches exist to make disciples to transform the world. And I don't necessarily mean that we have to go far, far away to do that, as Sarah has addressed already in her, her um, comments. We need to remember that in our b baptism, we were called to, to fulfill this mission that our bishop is calling us to. We have been treated generously by God. Now we need to live generously. We fall short, but God still loves us. We must go and love everyone else with the same love given to us. And this is really our purpose as a church. Change process is difficult. Sometimes we just expect the other person to go forward and do whatever it is we're invited to do. But you know, if we're going to make it work, we can't just depend on the other person. We need to engage ourselves in this opportunity ourselves. The bishop called our attention to mission. If we can go to the last overhead of the mission. It, perhaps you might recall in our report last year, we talked about how our church is not local. <laughs> we are part of a huge, huge worldwide church. And here's a, another example of that. He called our attention to mission as a powerful means to share the love of Christ with those far and wide. And personally, these are my reflections that our church is filled with the spirit of reaching out and helping people. Many, many ways. Every time I think about it, it's like we have people helping feed the hungry. We have people helping the homeless. We have people calling up somebody that's not feeling well. We have people sending cards of encouragement. We have people that constantly are doing things of caring for one another. So we have we have done big projects. Bishop Unda's project, you know, we raised a huge amount of money, much more than any other individual church has done. And I think we should be encouraged by that. We have sent tools of learning to our uh, school of theology in Africa. That was a big job. And we just keep on doing things like that. So. If you talk about DNA, I guess it's already in our DNA. And um, I would hope that we have had a chance to, with what Sarah shared with you, to really think about what we can do. Our goal given to every congregation was to increase itself by 10% or to add 10 new members. That's not too hard. <laughs> but the main goal, it's not numbers, it's 
doing what God has called us to do. And I believe this is the place where that can happen. Thank you very much.